Mr. President, Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of His Excellency Desiree Delano Bouterse, President of the Republic of Suriname, I wish to extend to Mr. Lachak congratulations on his election to preside over the General Assembly. Suriname is grateful to the past chair for his efforts in addressing the issues of the small and vulnerable states within the SITS construct. We wish Mr. Peter Thompson success in his new role as a special envoy of the Secretary General on Oceans. Mr. President, allow me to address critical issues related to the theme of this year's session, which are directly related to Suriname and the region we belong to. Suriname, Mr. President, cannot but give special attention to the extraordinary fashion in which the annual hurricane season has presented itself in the Caribbean. Our thoughts go out to the families, the many families, the mothers, the children, the elderly, and the sick who are living the worst possible nightmares. We are convinced that those affected will be comforted with the hope that all is not lost, since the world community stands with them and pray for the betterment and speedy recovery of our region. We also acknowledge the suffering in Mexico as a result of the recent heavy earthquakes and express our deep felt sympathy for those victimized. Excellency, these events confront us with the relativity of human power and state power, whether unilateral or multilateral. A quick review of the damage caused by the recent natural disasters shows us the destruction of the means of production and physical infrastructure. This, Mr. President, has created a social disruption that goes far beyond the immediate needs of the victimized societies. We also observe that the world at large demonstrates a strong sense of solidarity when calamity strikes and humanitarian assistance is urgently needed. However, to alleviate the desperate condition of the peoples, we must, in our international efforts, address the calamities in a further and wider perspective. We must, Mr. President, assist the respective governments in restructuring the social, economic, and physical infrastructure in a way that these states can become more resilient and reduce their vulnerability in the future. This will require the development of innovative concepts and intensive sharing of global experiences. Combining forces at the global scale has become crucial. Furthermore, it will imply aggressive mobilization of adequate resources. Such necessary resource mobilization will face obstacles. We will have to fa face the fact that a number of the more affluent nations entertain inward-looking policies that do not augur well with the pressing need to join hands in solving these truly global problems. The past weeks made it very clear to all of us that the forces of nature do not discriminate. And Mr. President, no, they don't. And Suriname strongly supports the view that nations should proportionately contribute at a global scale if we want to survive as humanity. When scientists indicate precise and foreseeable natural disasters, it's obvious that we should take precautionary measures, mitigate possible dangers, and adapt existing structures to minimize the effect. Becoming more resilient remains the only way. It is in this regard unacceptable that Caribbean countries, including Suriname, 
are being graduated into middle-income countries with a zero option to obtain concessional loans. Mr. President, today I add my voice to the lamentation regarding the fact that the vulnerability of these countries should not be taken, in, should be taken into account when classifications are applied. Thus, it's very ironic that Suriname is facing such threats of climate change, while at the same time, our country is making tremendous contributions mitigating climate change. As a high forested, low deforestation country with 90% forest cover, which is the highest of the world, Suriname provides regulation services of, to the global climate, including as carbon sink. In addition to providing livelihoods to indigenous and tribal communities, our forests are biodiversity hotspots with an impressive number of endemic and international significant species. Our forests also support freshwater regulation as part of the unique Amazon ecosystem and provide employment and income generation to an active forest industry. Above all, we have set aside for conservation purposes 1.6 million hectares of pristine rainforest referred to as the Central Nature Reserve, Suriname Nature Reserve, as a gift to humanity. While Suriname's greenhouse gas emissions have historically been negative, it is a challenge to enhance the country's economic development while maintaining this unique position in the world. To achieve this goal, Suriname is ready to partner with governments, the global community, and other stakeholders to transform our economy in which environmental protection, including through Red Plus, social advancement, and economic prosperity take central stage. Our multi-annual development plan, recently adopted by Parliament, is testimony to this vision for our nation's sustainable development. On the issues of non-interference and non-intervention, Mr. President, I draw your attention to the following. The natural disasters I just referred to coincide with growing political conflicts which may well lead to a serious loss of human lives and the destruction of human achievements. A number of these conflicts are related to a stark disrespect for the basic principles enshrined in the Charter of the United Nations since 1945. Non-interference in the affairs of sovereign states and non-intervention are not empty principles. They are based on a firm belief that all people are equal and that the prevailing structures of government and democracy cannot be prescribed externally. Recent interventions in the Middle East have not created better societies. On the contrary, we have witnessed divided war warring fractions that can hardly be qualified as an improvement to the governments that were ousted. Suriname also has, the experience, has experienced the ill effects of interference in internal affairs. The destruction of infrastructure and means of production amounting to approximately 300 million US dollars, and much worse, is the fact that hundreds of children were deprived of access to education and proper health care. Today, as a nation, we are still suffering from the results of the so-called foreign-supported internal strife that disrupted societies in the interior that were characterized by a socio-economic order that lasted for more than 300 years. Suriname knows what interference means, and the only way we have dealt with it is by insisting on dialogue, resulting in the signing of the peace treaty in May 1992. So when we tell the world that non-interference and non-intervention are principles to adhere to at all costs, we are talking from our own experience. 
Over almost three decades, Suriname's commitment to peace and development through the promotion of dialogue and the implementation of broad-based social programs remained in full accordance with the principles and guidelines of the United Nations. Dialogue in the spirit of mutual respect has led to peace and prosperity. In this same vein, in 2012, the legislator passed an amendment to the amnesty law of 1992. This by applying amnesty to the full period of political violence in Suriname, covering the period of 1980 to 1992. In doing so, the legislator complied with Article 8 of the Constitution, which bans discrimination and guarantees equal rights to all citizens. This amendment further provided for a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, allowing for clear, distinct, a clear distinction between politically motivated violence and criminal acts. Mr. President, allow me to inform this gathering that in 2015, this road to peace and sustainable development of Suriname enjoyed full accept, acceptance, noting that a greater majority elected the incumbent government. Moreover, civil society has taken up the responsibility to advance the peace process through the implementation of initiatives contributing to the cause of truth finding and reconciliation. It is against this backdrop, Excellency, of the aforementioned development. It is with concern that Suriname took note of the unverified and biased comments published by the UN Special Rapporteur on the independence of judges and lawyers. Therefore, Suriname categorically rejects the assertions of this special procedures mandate holder who did not provide the government an opportunity to respond in a timely manner. Mr. President, the 71st General Assembly marked a milestone in the way the world views the five decades old unilateral economic, commercial, and financial boycott against Cuba. Last year, there was not one state that voted against the resolution to bring a definite end to this unilateral decision that has proven to be unproductive from all angles. However, the current reality obliges us to continue expressing our deepest concern since we learned about the continuation of this detrimental and unilateral policy. Suriname, therefore, with absolute respect for the sovereignty of each nation to determine its own policies, urges that constructive dialogue and cooperation must prevail and that bridges must be built on the basis of equality and respect for independence and sovereignty. Suriname rejects any measure that might strengthen the blockade, which is in violation of international law, the sovereignty of states, the principles of non-intervention in internal affairs and self-determination. My government reiterates the critical importance of these principles and underscores the relevance of the processes of dialogue, diplomacy, peaceful resolution of conflicts, and political and economic cooperation as building blocks for stability, peace, and democracy in the Americas. In this line of thought, we encourage the UN member states in general, and especially the South American and Caribbean states, to deal with the problem of our sister nation of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela in a constructive manner. Let us keep on stressing the need for dialogue between all parties. History proves that interference and intervention has never turned out successful. Mr. President, Suriname is deeply concerned about the current developments in the Korean Peninsula. We believe that the interest of the Korean people must remain paramount in whatever configuration for a sustainable solution. 
First and foremost, the Korean people must be given guarantees that the use of violence can never be a solution for the problem, whether this originates in North Korea or wherever. The only remaining road to a sustainable solution will be dialogue and negotiations for the dignity and well-being of the Korean people in the struggle for peace and development. The example of South America and the Caribbean in remaining a nuclear-free zone could well serve as a model to be followed. The absence of nuclear weapons creates an environment which is conducive for dialogue and meaningful negotiations. Mr. President, the global village is becoming ever more interdependent. Different cultures and ethnic orientations are rapidly becoming the basis for racial and global conflicts. Therefore, we have to find new paradigms to effectively limit the dogmatic adherence to religious and social concepts. Showing tolerance and mutual respect have become a must if we want to guarantee future generations peace and sustainability. The government of Suriname is following the recent re-emergence of right-wing extremism framed in populism in many quarters of the world, not only with keen interest, but also with a certain degree of concern. This development has the potential of putting the social cohesion within countries and bilateral relations between nations under severe pressure, thereby affecting opportunities and the potential for cooperation. Suriname has worked tirelessly to achieve national unity, which has resulted in a very diverse and well-integrated society where tolerance forms one of the basic principles which underpins its very existence. Thanks to the type of nation we have built, very disturbing and destabilizing factors such as right-wing extremism, ethnic and religious intolerance cannot have or find a place in our nation. Neither will it ever be able to take root and grow. Suriname today enjoys an exceptional era of tolerance and mutual respect with Christians, Hindus, Jews, Muslims, and other religious denominations, living in an atmosphere of peace and mutual respect. Suriname, with roots from all continents of the world, has become, through the intensive dialogue and mutual respect, a shining example of the importance of not entertaining supremacist concepts. Therefore, the government of Suriname is considered best positioned to understand and, and analyze the current global trend, which needs to be reversed with immediate effect. And Suriname stands ready to share its experience and best practices with other sister nations on the issue of nation building based on diversity, pluralism, integration, and peace. Then, Mr. President, I'm convinced that others will be better able to understand one of the important mottos of Suriname, diversity is power. My government strongly believes, Excellency, that focusing on people is the quintessence of the application of power. Suriname is an example in kind. As a nation, we have recently faced the ill effects of largely commodity-based export economy. The sharp downturn in oil and gold prices in recent years combined with the unfortunate closure of the century-old bauxite and alumina complex, challenged Suriname's macroeconomic management since mid-2015. By any international standards, Suriname faced a severe shock that was compounded on the balance of payment side by the sharp increase in imports related to two major investment projects in oil and gold mining that together accounted for about 35% of the 
of annual GDP. We estimate that the economy contracted severely by more than 10% in 2016, requiring unprecedented fiscal and monetary policy adjustments and some temporary balance of payment support to stabilize the exchange rate, reduce domestic demand, and re-establish a viable balance of payments position, the monetary authorities sharply curtailed credit creation in the country with credit to, to the private sector contracting in nominal terms. Since October 2016, the exchange rate has stabilized. Monthly inflation rates have fallen to less than 1%, and the country has returned to a current account surplus position. Mr. President, our macroeconomic response to the external and fiscal pressures started in earnest in August 2015 with a massive contraction in government expenditures and increase in taxation. The government acknowledges that the extractive sector producing gold, fossil fuels, and other marketable minerals will remain critical for our economic development in the foreseeable future. We accept this reality, being fully aware that the wealth created must be deployed in financing a well-planned initiative to expand our economy in a sustainable manner. With this objective in mind, the government had, has recently adopted very important legislative measures. One, dealing with the establishment of a sovereign wealth and stabilization fund, and the other introduces the institutional framework which will facilitate foreign direct investments. As outlined in our multi-annual development plan, Suriname intends to strike a balance between the export of commodities on the one hand and export of final products in sync with the services industry on the other hand. Mr. President, Suriname acknowledges her citizens as the most important resource for its development. In spite of the challenging budgetary constraints, the socio-economic policies of the government remain people-oriented. The continued application of the basic health care law provides for proper health care for the entirety of our population. In addition, Mr. Chair, as announced by President Bautista and as part of the social contract, adequate housing, access to education, youth participation, engagement, and sports development, job creation, care for persons with disabilities and the elderly have remained priorities for sustainable development and growth. In conclusion, Excellency, the message delivered by Secretary General Antonio Guterres assured all of us his commitment to the theme of this year's meeting. Suriname pledges its full support and cooperation. The implementation of the ambitious 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development in sync with the necessary reform of the United Nations will carry a lot of weight. This will be a formidable challenge and therefore my government believes that in addition to domestic resource mobilization, consideration must be given to accessible financing for development capacity building, innovation, and the transfer of technology for developing countries from a wide array of financing mechanisms. Mr. President, having addressed these matters that are of vital importance for the survival of humanity based on the principles of the United Nations, we bring to mind an Amerindian saying that we have not inherited the earth, but that we have the earth on loan for future generations. It is up to us to give this wise saying its substance. Mr. President, I wish in the final analysis to underscore and reiterate the utmost importance of youth involvement and participation 
at the highest levels. In this regard, my government has made it a priority to create the conditions for youth to be part of the decision-making processes. I refer to young people, among others, as innovators, members of parliament and cabinet, and as CEOs within what we refer to as the Youth Adult Partnership. In fact, in 2010, our government instated a special ministry with responsibility for youth and sport development. It gives me pleasure to announce that this year, youth representatives are part of my official delegation to this 72nd session. Furthermore, it is true political will and true political will, Mr. President, that more women in our society can excel to the highest echelons of political decision making. Mr. President, the 2030 agenda envisages that a world which will guarantee all its inhabitants of our planet a climate conducive, which is climate conducive to self-development of respect for human dignity, of tolerance towards other cultures, and the ultimate goal of giving our planet the gift of diversity based on mutual respect. Mr. President, finally, it is up to each one of us, regardless of our status in society. It is up to each nation, whether big or small. Mr. President, it is up to this multilateral organization to focus on people and strive for peace and a decent life for all on a sustainable planet. Mr. President, we owe it to ourselves. Yes, we owe it to this and coming generations. I thank you and God bless you.